I think you guys are well aware that I'm a huge Fantastic Four fan. I love everything about their dynamic. I love Hickman's run that expands on these heroes, which I'll get into later. I enjoyed pieces of the two Tim Story movies. No, not you, Galactus. I love seeing the FF in Earth's Mightiest Heroes, which in my opinion is the most accurate version of the Fantastic Four we've seen in media. The Fantastic Four put a few bad guys away in here, but we're mostly just out exploring whatever new thing Reed's found. That being said, today we look at the 2006 animated series, Fantastic Four World's Greatest Heroes. This version of the Fantastic Four is a unique interpretation, released after the commercial success of the first Tim Story film and debuting before its sequel, it pretty much acts as an extension of the movies, borrowing from the films with Alicia's ethnicity and Doom's origin being closely tied to the core four. Whilst there's some really great aspects, the overall show feels more like an extension of the films and less an extension of the original comics. That being said, there were some nice Fantastic Four easter eggs from the comics, like the trial of Johnny Storm resembling the trial of Reed Richards or the scrolls posing as cows from the comics. Scrolls, I might add, that Reed wiped the minds of, making them think that they're actually cows. Yeah, that happened. We also get to see the likes of the Grand Master, an elder of the universe, and the small screen debut of Squirrel Girl. Of course, there are other heroes that feature like She-Hulk, Hulk, Namor, Iron Man, and Ant-Man, with an unspoken and unnamed cameo by Peter Parker. This guy's a freelance photographer. Hi, my name's- Yeah, whatever. So the plan is, he follows me around and takes photos whenever I save the day. I think a standout element to the show is its animation and art design. The show feels hyper detailed, detail you only see in the likes of anime. There's a real texture to all the surfaces. Heck, they even took the time to draw in characters' eyelashes. The show combines 3D and 2D animation almost seamlessly. Sometimes it's noticeable, but largely the skyscrapers go unnoticed. Whilst the show is largely detailed, it means that they have to use speed lines for a majority of the action to save time on animating a detailed moving background. It's sort of a win some you lose some scenario. Sure the show is rather gorgeous to look at, but some of the movements can look a little stiff compared to, say, something with more of a simplistic design, like the spectacular Spider-Man. I feel like everyone else who has touched on this show, who has reviewed this series, has come at it from the point of view of being an animation fan first and foremost, not necessarily a fan of the Fantastic Four. Reviewing the logistics of the show, its animation, its voice talent, not necessarily diving into the characters or the story. I get the tingling feeling that other critics or other YouTubers don't really understand these characters. They've never flicked through the deeply personal adventures of the Marvel Knights line or dived into the sprawling epic that is Hickman's tender yet thought-provoking run on the characters. When I hear people say that this is Reed Richards without actually thinking about what they're saying, it just sort of makes my heart sink. It's sort of Reed Richards, like the iconography is there, his childlike wonder of science, his socially distant persona, but what we get is a stereotype of Reed, missing the tender human moments Reed may have with a stranger about to commit suicide, or the quiet moments he may share with Sue. I'll touch on him later. I want to preface this video, this isn't going to be me trying to discount every analysis of the show, largely I really enjoyed it. It pretty much hits the nail on the head in most areas. It's fun tone, it's quick pace, it's likeable characters, no, not you, Johnny. It has all the elements of the Fantastic Four, but for me there's a reason this show isn't as talked about as, say, Spectacular Spider-Man, Earth's Mightiest Heroes, or Young Justice. I felt it was necessary to dive into this show and find out what does and doesn't work in an effort to create a reasonably sound analysis on a show that takes into account my love for the characters, but the overall need for quality first and foremost. Speaking of characters, let's talk the main four. By far the character that speaks the most to me was Ben Grimm. He's perfectly adapted here. Of course, we get the lovable and rough Boston sounding hard ass. However, undercutting that is a character arc of a man that deals with his disfigurement. He starts out wanting to be human at any cost. However, once he gets that, he realizes the deep satisfaction to help those in danger outweighs his own need for normalcy. To him, he'd rather be a hero. He finds his humanity in his actions, not his appearance. By the end of the season, coming to terms with being the thing. You don't have to. Nah, don't sweat it, Stretch. I may not be as pretty as I was, but it's okay. I've done some good. Save the world here and there. It's all right. I'll find a cure. I promise. I know you will. 
While Susan's character was perfectly fun, in a way giving us what you'd expect, the motherly figure she's so often recognised as, my trouble with the characters comes from the show's interpretation of Johnny and Reed. Now I'll dive into this later, but the show feels like an extension of the movies, not the comics. Best explained through Johnny and Reed. Johnny in the movies seems like a stereotype of his character in the comics, so what we get is a version of a character that is a stereotype of a stereotype. He's a caricature of someone who's self-indulgent. <laughs> He often being the cause for most of the problems the Fantastic Four find themselves in. He takes the gravity out of the more serious episodes. His comedic relief doesn't relieve, it spoils the drama that's trying to build. Susan and I will try to locate Doom and find out what changed in the past. Ben, you and Johnny... Wait, where is Johnny? Sorry, I stopped at Doombucks. This place is crazy. Mm. Machino. Plain and simple, he has all the fun and none of the heart Johnny is synonymous for. Reed is a little more complex to explain, seeing as the things the show get wrong about Reed tend to be more deeper than missing, say, the heart of the character. You see, this show gets a lot about Reed right. He's the guy that gets the four out of sticky situations. He's the leader and the one who calls the shots. He has this childlike wonder for science and new discoveries, and he often has his head in his work. However, I think that's all they really get about him right. And to be quite frank, that's really just the surface of the character. If Reed in this feels a bit wooden, it's because they're missing the finer minutia of the character. Reed is a man that doesn't apologise for his brilliance. It makes him direct and to the point, coming off colder than most. I can think of 14 different ways to seal you in that armour forever. <laughs> <laughs> you can see they tried this, but their portrayal of a blunt Reed makes him socially awkward. Something I wouldn't say Reed is. He's just acutely aware of everything, of people's intentions, their motives, and his mind gets in the way of being authentically human and vulnerable in that moment, instead cutting to the logic of the argument, appearing blunt. Here he feels like a genius that makes some pretty naive moves. He's constantly outsmarted and tricked. I think the only time they genuinely showed how smart Reed was was when he deduced Iron Man's identity in his first few encounters. Being part of a team does have its advantages, Tony. If we work together, we can stop Doom. What? How did you... Of course you're Iron Man. In terms of structure, the episodes are self-contained, meaning the plot for that episode will start and end within that 30 minute period. Sure, their ongoing battle with Doom will occur, but there's no long spanning narrative or payoff to a larger building story in the background. As a result, it keeps the episodes simple and easy to jump into. Simple fun action that sees a problem get introduced and fixed by the end of the episode. Whilst that's nice that they're largely disconnected, I couldn't imagine how amazing it'd be if they applied the multi-layered characters and story of, say, Wolverine and the X-Men. Even extending the smallest stories they have into two-parters could have done the trick, to further develop the characters and explore the new world that they're in, instead of rushing to the resolution of the episode to fit the desired 30 minutes. As for the conflicts themselves, they take issue with how they come about. In the comics, the Fantastic Four are adventurers. They seek out new planets, worlds, dimensions, and realities. They seek to expand their understanding of the universe. Here, they mainly reside in New York, quite similar to the movies, mind you, with the out there concepts coming to them. To me, it robs the Fantastic Four of an element that made them different to all the other Marvel heroes their need for a sense of discovery. In the comics, the FF are explorers first and heroes second, and I feel like for the purpose of a TV show, they leaned more on the hero side of things first. That's honestly fun, but it makes the Fantastic Four feel much smaller than they are. Doom residing in New York and not Latveria only proving my point. Sure, we go to the negative zone, but for the most time it's spent in a ship. Sure, we go to Atlantis, but we're confined to a singular room. I never got the sense that our heroes got to adventure, that they got to discover for a long time. I feel like if we spent an entire episode in a unique environment and not just one minute, then something like the Jurassic period would appear a lot more fun, whilst expanding the world these heroes inhabit. This can be best said for the episode in which the Fantastic Four go back in time to stop a future in which Doom rules. We visit a dystopian New York and the launch of the shuttle. It was nice to have an episode where the stakes were high and an episode where the villains didn't come to them. An episode where our heroes actively had to traverse time to fix a problem. Susan, listen to me, you have to go back. Go back to the beginning. Something I really liked was the intro. Not only being catchy and mysterious, it also depicts the origins of the heroes, which allows us to jump straight into the show, not needing to waste time with an obligatory origin episode. The closest we get to anything like that would be the time travel episode just mentioned, that sees our heroes hiding from their past selves at the launch of the shuttle. In saying that, our heroes do not jump into a complete world. We get to see the fun and excitement of meeting new characters as they do, meeting the likes of Mole Man, Annihilus, Namor, all the way to the 
Impossible Man and Ronan. Speaking of villains, largely they are rudimentary. Most only seek revenge in a very mustache twirling kind of way. Of course this being Doom, but in a way that's sort of fitting for his character. What surprised me was more seeing that be the case for Ronan, an accuser who's meant to be objective and impartial in the comics. If you've seen him in Earth's Mightiest Heroes, you know what I mean. The supreme intelligence wishes this planet judged, and that is what I will do. Here he becomes a brute simply using his power in the Kree to wage a personal war on our heroes. It's sort of childish to be frank. Whilst we're on the topic of villains, let's talk its most iconic one, Doom. Surprisingly enough, I'm fine with changing his origin. Sure. Do what you will, have your interpretation, but to me the constant use of his character lessens his threat. Darth Vader is a great example of this, the more you show him being defeated, the less impact he has as a character, it's why they used him so sparingly in Rebels. If a hero has always got away, he'd appear less and less competent as time went on. Same can be said for Doom here, he's beaten time and time again. What starts out as an incredibly menacing looking villain, with a really nice design to his fortress and the character himself, sort of falls apart by the end of the season. I just I wasn't afraid of him in the way that I was afraid of Doom from Earth's Mightiest Heroes. Enough! None lay hands on Doom. Whilst it may appear that I've been direct with this show, know it's from a place of love. I love these characters and only want the best for them, and pretending that this show is the perfect incarnation of the Fantastic Four won't do that. I really did enjoy this show. It's a really easy watch and incredibly easy to jump into any episode. The villains may be two dimensional and Johnny, well, he's Johnny, but what we get is a series that had some bonkers action, a great arc for Ben, and a bunch of fun tales with Marvel's first family. I think if you look at this show as an extension of the movies, not necessarily an adaptation of how they are in the comics, then it works perfectly fine. The show is just gorgeous to look at. I know I'm repeating myself, but the action really is something else, and you can tell the people who created this series came at it from a labour of love. They wanted to do the best for these heroes, and whilst they're just slightly off, what we got was still an incredible accomplishment, an ensemble series that sees our heroes dive into everything that makes the FF so much fun, and by far Marvel's best try at the Fantastic Four, excluding AMH. That being said, hopefully you guys can see my opinion as just my opinion. However, I've taken the time to study this show, analysing what worked and didn't work, and hopefully it can come across more factual. I completely respect if you love this show, or if you're somehow nostalgic about it. Heck, I was too. I grew up with shows around this time, but for me a show needs to be more than just nostalgic to be considered to be good. As always, have a lovely day everyone, and I'll see you guys in the next video. Ciao.